I'm going to talk about an extension that we've made in version 14.1 and then I'm going to spend 10 minutes or so on something that we're looking at doing in version 15 which is, which is pretty cool as well. Um, before I get into that, I'll recap on what data binding is and maybe give you a little bit more detail on the internals that, that perhaps we've not talked about before, just to get you up to speed before we talk about this mysterious matrix thing. So data binding is essentially a way of separating, well, sharing your, um, your data in your workspace with the GUI layer of your application. Um, traditionally, with Quad WC programming, you'd maybe, if you wanted to populate a list box, you'd have um, the items of the list box, and you'd have an array, a vector of character vectors in your workspace, and you'd set the items property of the list box to be that vector of names, and at that point they were separate. If you modified the array, it had no effect on the list box. If the user selected items in the list box, or maybe it was an edit field and they changed the content, that had no bearing on the data in your workspace. But what data binding allows you to do is that it sort of facilitates this MWWM model, that, um, MVVM model, sorry, that Morton actually mentioned, was it today or was it yesterday? Earlier, Morton mentioned earlier, um, where you can sort of um, abstract your data from your UI logic. And Morton had a great slide yesterday where he had um, a bit of GUI up in the middle with some data declarations at the top and bottom, and then the GUI faded away, and the application technically would carry on still working. You could assign to the variables and the data binding running behind the systems would glue everything together and it would all carry on working without the UI. So the idea of the data binding, or one of the ideas of the data binding, is that it allows you to think of your data, you can put your data hat on if you like and just think about the data and the interactions between various parts of your data. And then you could wander over here and put your, your hip trendy GUI designer hat on and decide how you wanted your GUI to look. And you could pretty much swap in, mind swap completely from one hat to the other. Um, yeah, so, and as I mentioned, then this data binding works two ways. If you data bind a variable to an edit field in your GUI, and the user then types into the edit field, then the data in your workspace changes immediately. Okay, and you can attach callbacks and notifications to that, to that so that once that value changes, you can maybe validate it and then do further actions. Um, under the covers, um, as far as... Okay, and what I should say really at this point is is that this presentation is entirely .NET and Windows desktop based. Okay, now Morton mentioned that sort of the notion of data binding and the things that you can do, you know, we can move over to other platforms, you know, with maybe my server um, and maybe even onto other devices as well. But the current implementation, the current state of the play is that it's all just Windows desktop and .NET. Which means that then I can say right now that a data binding source is nothing more and nothing less than something that implements a prescribed set of .NET um, interfaces. Now an interface is a, an OO term and an interface is essentially a definition of a related set of functions. Maybe anything from one to you know, hundreds of functions that all perform a single job. And if you implement an instance of a class and you say, I am going to support the functions that are in this interface, it means that anybody that wants to consume your class knows that you're going to provide the functionality that is prescribed by that interface. And so all of the data binding sources that we talk about are things that implement one or more interfaces. Um, and so currently in 14.0, um, and clearly we can do this in 14.1 as well, in the interpreter, using the iBeam that we have, we can create data binding sources for the scalar value. You know, a number, you know, a, a, an integer, a double, a, a boolean. Um, and also with the data binding, we consider a, a character vector um, in the data binding mechanism that goes out as a .NET string, which we consider to be a scalar entity. So if we are data binding to, in broad speaking terms, a scalar, then all we need to implement, implement there is this thing called the I notify property changed interface, which is a very simple thing, but basically it contains the functionality that allows the data side of the communication to let the UI side change, know that the data has changed so that it can update itself. And the reverse can happen as well, where when the UI element detects that the user has changed the data in the UI, that information can be passed back to the data side and we can fix things up in the workspace. And of course, for something like that, there's also a mechanism not only of letting the 
other side know that the data has changed, but also to have a way of actually retrieving the current value of the data. If we create a data bound source to a vector, whether it's a vector of numbers or a vector of strings or a vector of namespaces in, in Dialog APL, then we implement a number of interfaces, all of which are related to enumerating through each of the values that are in that, that vector. And these are the simplest ones that are going, that are in there. There's also things like the iCollection notify changed interface, which allows us to let the UI layer know that an element has been added to a list. Okay, so imagine in this case we had a vector of character vectors which was data bound to a list box in a GUI. If the data side of the code appends an item to the um, to that list of character vectors, then we go through the I collection notify change, and the UI then knows that it needs to add an add an extra string on the bottom of the list that it displays. If we data bind to then a namespace in um, in, the, in the workspace, then essentially the interpreter enumerates through all of the named members in that namespace, and it does one of the two things that we talked about before. If it's a scalar variable, a, a string or a number or maybe a .NET object, which in itself would be a scalar entity, then we do the notify property change um, and we provide an interface to get the value of the data as well. But if the value of the variable in the namespace is a vector, then we do exactly what we would have done if you'd bound to the vector directly without going through the namespace stage. So we implement iList, iCollection, iEnumerable. So in version 14.1, we introduce support for data binding to a matrix. So we've moved up the rank notch by, by one. And essentially, a matrix can be considered to be just a vector of rows. Okay, so when we data bind to a matrix, essentially what the other end sees is, is exactly the same sort of thing as if we were binding to a vector of namespaces. It sees an array of objects. Um, but because it's an array of objects, then first of all our matrix implements I list, I collection, I enumerable. We're presenting it as if it were a vector of rows. Okay. Um, and then a row, for example, for each column in the row of our matrix, we can sit, we expose those like properties in exactly the same way that we would expose the name of the members of a namespace as properties. We expose each element in a column of a matrix as a named property. And of course, in your matrix, your matrix can be nested. So if your matrix, if an element of your matrix contains a list, then we expose that as a list. If it contains a matrix, then we expose that as a matrix. And all of these definitions pretty much then are recursive. You can have a namespace that contains a namespace that contains a matrix, or a matrix, a cell of which contains a matrix, a cell of which contains a matrix, and we can expose everything just with these sets of interfaces. Okay, so again, just to reiterate then, as far as data binding is concerned, a matrix and a vector of namespaces are essentially the same thing. Each, is, each encompasses a collection of objects. You, if you like, you can consider in one case that it's a, a, a selection of objects that have columns, and in the other case it's a selection of objects that have properties. But when we get down to the data binding layer, they're pretty much identical. So identical that the guy at the other end, the guy doing the GUI, writing the GUI interface, or using whatever mechanism is being used to interrogate the data binding, doesn't care. He doesn't know whether in the workspace it's a matrix. He doesn't know that it's a namespace or a vector of namespaces. It's of no interest to him. He just makes calls through these interfaces and that says, you know, enumerate through the items in this collection. And if they're rows in a matrix, then the interpreter dishes them out. And if they're namespaces in a vector of namespaces, the interpreter just dishes them out and presents the data in exactly the same way. So, I'm often criticised for not being the best when it comes to having data samples. So, there's no CDDDB in this presentation. Well, uh, not for the first ten minutes. We're about eight minutes in. <laughs> so, you know, it's coming. So anyway, so I need you to find something else. And I, 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 I really struggle to find anything that where there would be a reasonable amount of data that might have some meaning to you guys that, that I could 
you know, that I could think of a sensible way to illustrate and get across. So I decided I'd have a, bit, a little bit of a look online for some historical share prices. And you can go to Google Finance and you can type in the code for whoever you want and you can download you know, varying numbers of um, share prices um, for your favourite stock. And I went somewhere and I got, I don't know, 12 years of stuff. Um, so essentially what I've downloaded then is a matrix of data. Each row is the details of, a, of share transactions on a particular day for this particular company. So we end up with the date of the transaction, the price at opening time, the price at close time on the day, the highest price that the shares achieved during the day, the lowest price that the shares achieved during the day, and the volume, which I believe in technical terms is the number of shares that changed hands on that day, or something. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to data bind to this information, both as ma a matrix and as vector of namespaces. So let's just go through side by side and see where things might differ from the APL side. So in the namespace case, we have a vector of prices. In the matrix case, we have a matrix of prices. In each case, there are 3,466 prices. I have data for 3,500 days going back for what's that, 10 years or so. There's some days missing. Okay, if we want to look at the first 10 rows of the data, clearly the matrix expression is easier. In the namespace case, um, we have to know what the names of all of our fields are, but we get the same data. The um, data in here is just in here as a string, just for convenience. Um, if we want to look at... Oh, okay, yeah. So, and we can see that the, um, in the namespace case, each of the namespaces contains the same set of variables. But of course, in the matrix case, we have no such names. We just have the rectangular array of data. So if we then attempt to create a data source from each of NSPAH3 and just the, the matrix case, 2015 iBeam is the iBeam that we use to create a data source, and it's the thing that returns this .NET object that implements all of these interfaces. So each of these, so source now is the actual .NET object that we're going to pass over to the GUI. Okay, but we can also interrogate it a little bit ourselves without needing any GUI. It's just a .NET object like any other. The interpreter is very good at talking to .NET objects, so we can interrogate it and look at it a little bit. And we can see that in both cases then, this collection has the expected number of items in it. In both cases, then, we can retrieve the... Let's just go with first. The first element of the collection. The reason I'm using origin zero is because .NET always works in origin zero, and if I start using origin one in the APL, then if you don't get confused, I'm certainly going to get confused. Okay, so what we're saying here is dig out the first element of the collection and then tell me what properties it's got. Okay, and for here things start to diverge a little bit. Okay, what's happened here is when we created the data source with the 2015 iBeam, because we had names for our variables in the namespaces, we were able to automatically generate the names for the properties in the data bound source. Okay, in the matrix case, um, there were no such names. So the interpreter has come up with some default names for each of the columns in the matrix. Um, and it's done that because we called 2015 iBeam monadically. Exactly as we had done in the namespace case. Um, which means if we want to dig out any of the values from the data source, and this is the sort of code that you'd see in the, in the GUI side where it wants you to consume the data. Okay, we have to, we at this point have to use different names. For source zero, we can get the low and the high value. But for the matrix case, or for the data that's come from the matrix, source, okay, we, we have to use the different names. So things have diverged at this point. Okay, but not to worry. Uh, oh, and this is just saying that, you know, the original data is, is, is the same. We can use matrix syntax in the one case to dig it out. And in the other case, we use dotted namespace notation to get those two values out. But the names are different. But not to worry, because what we can do is we can use um, the, the 2015 IBM dyadically and provide names for each of our columns in our matrix. So we don't need to change our data. We can independently to our data matrix, we can provide the names that we want to be associated with the columns. 
So what we do is we have a separate matrix um, which just contains the information about our columns. And there is one row per column in our data. The first column in our information is the name that we want to associate with each column. And the second column is the data type that this column will have when it gets out to the .NET world. Now generally, and it's, it's, it's very surprising how far you can get by just defaulting that second column and just letting everything go out as the best type that the APL, that the interpreter thinks it, it can go out at. Um, you can do a lot without specifying the type. But I wanted to indicate that it was possible and I also wanted to have something in this column that was visible so that you could see that it was a two um, column matrix. So, if we provide that left hand argument to our 2015 I-beam and now get out the properties from the first row of our data bound source then we get the same names back that we had in the namespace check. So at this point everything is working the same. If we address this thing through our data source um, object, it just looks like a collection. The names are the same, the values are the same. Nothing at this point knows whether we're talking to a vector of namespaces or whether we're talking to a matrix. Um, and typically then, in, in the most simple case, we would then, if we wanted to put this in some GUI, we would create an instance of a WPF data grid object and we would assign its data context to be this um, data source that we created with the ID. So just to summarize then, um, data binding is a way of sharing data with a GUI application. Uh, data binding source is just a thing that implements one or more .NET interfaces. Um, anything that knows about these interfaces can access the data. Those expressions that I was typing from in the session were just because the APL interpreter knows how to talk to .NET. If you have a function in C-sharp that you want to call that is declared as taking something that implements iList, okay, and iList is just one of these interfaces that allows the calling code to enumerate through the elements of the collection. Okay, so if you have a function that looks like this that wants to take an iList, you can run our 2015 IBM on an array and pass the resulting value to this function, and the C-sharp will be able to go through the elements of the array. You don't have to use this for GUI. You can use this... Anything that knows about these interfaces can use this mechanism to go through your data. So matrix data is equivalent to a vector of rows. So is equivalent to a vector of objects. When they're in the workspace, it's equivalent to a vector of namespaces. And the consumer of your data doesn't know or care what the internal format is. And this is key. As long as we implement the interfaces, it doesn't matter what format our data is in. The other guy, the other end, doesn't see, doesn't know, doesn't care. So, let's come and look at this then in action. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load my um, workspace that contains my share prices. I'm going to switch box off because at the moment it's not particularly helpful. So, we can see in here I have this matrix that contains 3,500 by 6 uh, data points. And there are the first 10 rows of data. Okay, so I have a function here then called muck source, which we're going to pass the name of our uh, matrix to. It's going to set up that 6x2 matrix that we saw in the PowerPoint, and it's going to call our 2015 I beam. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create some GUI using Microsoft XAML markup language, which is how you see a lot of WPF stuff defined online and in samples. Looks a bit like XML. Maybe a little bit scary the first time you look at it. What I've tried to do is I've tried to use an external editor that knows about XAML and knows about XAML syntax colouring to try and beautify this a little bit. And syntactically what we've got here is we've got a piece of XAML that says create a window Okay, and within that window, create a data grid, and then that's, that's the end of my window. Well, it's like HTML with the tags and everything else. Um, and this little bit of syntax here says that the, um, the source of the items for the data grid is going to come via the data binding mechanism. And then finally, we have a four-liner that just 
um, uses the .NET framework to um, load some XML from, from that XAML that I showed you before. To all intents and purposes, it's, it's XML. Um, the function XML, sorry, XAMLreader.load um, interprets that XAML and then returns to us an instance of the window that was defined in that text. We then set the data context of the window to be the um, result of the 2015 I-beam on our variable called the data. Okay, and then we're just going to show the window as a modal dialog box. So if I call this thing now passing um, our matrix of... Um, share prices, then what we get is we get our GUI which contains nothing but our data grid, but it contains all of our data points. And obviously, as you'd expect, we've got the scroll bar, we can scroll down this stuff, we can go down and look all the way down, and we think we've got data all the way down to March this year, and we started at we started at I think it was 2002 we had the first sets of prices for, around about 2002. Okay, so that's the very simplest case, pretty much, of how can I display my data in a bit of WPF GUI. For a matrix, it's a, it's a nice thing to put it in a data grid. It's the closest WPF object that there is to our built-in grid object. Now, WPF does have an object called grid, which it uses for layout purposes, like stack panels and wrap panels that came up in the my server presentation. Okay, a stack panel is a thing that basically can stack things either horizontally or vertically. The grid control that we'll see in WPF obviously can stretch things out and um, align things both horizontally and vertically at the same time. Anyway, so there's our data displayed in a data grid. And we can do things with this, for example, we can uh, we can sort it um, on the columns. We don't have to write any code for that. It's aware of the data because it can ask for the interpreter for it when it needs it, and it can do the sorting. In all of these examples, once we've popped the GUI up, there is no APL code running anymore. All the APL code is, is, has done is set up the data in, in a format that then the, the GUI knows how to look at. Okay, so let's now look, make that... Um, that XAML, let's make our GUI layout a little bit more complicated. Okay, so what we've got here then is an example which it still defines our window. There is a window that down there is just the end of the window definition. We still have our data grid in there, which still has our binding in there. But it's all within a thing called a grid. And this is defining row and column layouts. And all I've got in here then is I have got three rows in my grid, I have got two columns in my grid, I have a chart, I have a image, I have a grid splitter, we'll, we'll see what that does in a moment, and we have the data grid. I'm not changing my data at all, all I've done is changed how my GUI is laid out. Now the important thing to note about this is that the when we look at the chart, the list of items that are to be charted Okay, is also achieved through data binding. But in this case, it's not bound directly to our data. It's bound to the selected items of the object in the window called grid1. So the gist of it is, is that our chart is going to display those items that we select in the grid, in the, from the data grid, and the data grid is going to show our share prices. So if we have a look at this GUI, okay, what we get then, is our data grid at the bottom. We get the chart here. We get an image for a well-known German sports car manufacturing company. Oh, and this grey line here, this is our grid splitter. And this is cool because this means that we can just grab that, move it up and down, and all the layout does nice things for us. Okay, and I said then that the, the data that was going to be graphed was the selected items or would be the selected items in our list. Currently, there are none. But if I select a share price, let's just select one that's a bit more interesting. Okay, so here we've got one. Presumably, this is the, this was the price going in at the beginning of the day. This is the lowest price the shares achieved on the day, the highest price, and then what the price was at the end of the day. 
And if we now just go through and increase our selection, then we can see, as if by magic, no APL code, it's all done with the data binding, as we select different ranges of data from our graph, sorry, from our grid, then it gets displayed in the graph. If we resize this, everything just gets done nicely for us. So all we've needed to provide to the GUI is our matrix of data. And then we've got the smart kids with the baseball caps that are on back to front, designing the GUI and making things look nice. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to show that example with the namespaces because um, there's not really a lot going on there. It wouldn't really demonstrate a great deal. Now, I promised you faithfully, and I know you've been waiting for it, so C, D, 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 B, D, really already? Right, we're going to have to crack on. So, let's load some um, other stuff. Let's load some CD uh, data. Okay, we're going to have a nice big quad PW. We're going to switch boxing on because it's going to be useful at this point. So in this workspace, I've got 1,328 namespaces. This is the old CD database. I've stripped this down a little bit. It's a little bit old, and it's only displaying those ones that I've got cover art for. Um, but in here, I also have a matrix of disk information. And in the same way that the namespaces have got titles and... Um, yeah, sorry. So the namespaces, here we go, have got a title object. Now the first, sorry, the second column in the grid contains the titles for every album in the collection. Similarly, the namespaces each have an artist member and the, I've switched to origin one here, I do apologize. The first column in the grid has the same artist information in it. And in fact, if we look at all of the information that's in the first element of the namespace, we have a artist, a title, and at nested, sorry, and then this is the namespace case, so what I've done is I've mixed the information about the tracks, and we've got the track number, the artist that performed the track, the track title, and its duration, and then finally we've got the path to the cover art on my machine. That information is exactly the same as what is in the first row of the matrix. It's identical, one was created from the other. Okay. But what this means is we can, I won't show you that XAML, we won't have time. I won't show you that. Because, ah, no, I will show you that because that MUC source is sort of interesting because it's illustrating that you can nest, that matrix that you have to specify what your column types are can be nested. Okay, so what we're saying here is that in the matrix case, we have four columns. First one is a string specifying the artist. Second one is a string specifying the title of the album. The last one is a spring, spring, string specifying the cover art. And the data that is in the third column, each element of which is also a matrix, in this case with four columns, each of which has a particular .NET data type. And if we run this thing, okay, then what we get is a rather uninspiring data grid displaying the information as a matrix. But what we've done here, this I think, okay, is showing the information that comes from the namespaces. This is the namespaces. If I run this expression again, the same function, but give it the matrix, we get exactly the same thing out. The GUI doesn't care namespaces or matrix. It's just seeing it as the same thing. Okay, I'm not going to show you the XAML as it gets more complicated, but I'm going to build up the examples. If we look at the, the vector of namespaces, again, using a slightly different uh, UI. Okay. Now I just... Oh, okay. The reason that was taking a wee while was because it was reading the cover art from this external USB disk. And that, if those of you on the front row as we go through will hear that thing chugging away and you may see smoke coming out. Okay, but here we are with a slightly more complicated GUI looking at the same data. We've not written any more APL code. We've just changed what the GUI looks like. And we can scroll down. Oh. We can scroll down and we can see the album art and the track list for every item that's in there. And we can run the same function again on the matrix, and it displays it exactly the same way. It doesn't care whether it's namespaces or whether it's an array, uh, a matrix of rows. The other thing that's important to point out here 
is that we're still using the data grid to display this data here. Okay, our original source had four rows. Okay, it had the artist name, the, the album name, the track information, and the cover art. But we're only seeing two columns here, and actually what we're doing is we're folding in the information that was in the, um, I know, the second and fourth columns we've, of the original data are both being displayed in the first column of the data grid. So the, the fact that we had four columns in our original data doesn't mean that we're constrained to displaying it as four columns in our original data grid. We can move them around, we can omit some, we can probably double some up as well if we wanted to do that. Okay, and then there are a few other cool things you can do with with the data grid. For example, um, you can configure it to nest or group the rows in your data by a particular attribute and or a particular column in this case. So what I've done here is I have grouped all of the rows of the data grid so that they're being displayed by the artist name. Again, I've not changed the data. Okay, the data is still a, what was it, 1300 by four row matrix or a 1300 vector element vector of uh, namespaces. This is now just extending how the GUI looks. And we can open this up and we can see the 19 albums by Dream Theater. We can close that and see the one album by Nickelback and so on. That's with the disks. And again, as you might expect, we give it the disk matrix and it does exactly the same thing. Now, if we look at the example that I think I showed, it was either last year or the year before in Florida. I rather ambitiously um, tried to write iTunes in 45 minutes, and I ended up with something like this. And as we click on the album art at the top, we get the track listing and the album art underneath as well. Okay, this is now, again, just using the same data that we had before, the, that uh, vector of 1,300 namespaces. Okay, again, just more complicated XAML. Now, as I click on this album art, just try and get a feel for how smoothly that scrolls round and how long it's taking. Because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run exactly the same example, but rather than using the vector namespaces, I'm going to use the matrix of the source. And hopefully you'll see as I scroll through this, it's much smoother and it's much quicker. So, perhaps it's not such a great surprise, you know, what with us being API and all, that accessing data out of a matrix performs somewhat better than digging out name the members from each of a bunch of namespaces. But the point from this, as, um, as we like to say, the take home from this is that your choice of how you represent your data is entirely down to you. The GUI layer, if you've got well-written XAML, the GUI layer doesn't care at all about where your data comes from. Right. Now, all right, I said I was going to spend 10 minutes on something. Um, I'm going to end up spending five minutes on it. So essentially, that's where we're at with version 14.1. Okay, no great shakes. It's now doing probably what most of you wanted it to do a couple of years ago when we started out. But there was a learning curve associated with this, and because the underlying architecture is essentially an array of objects when you're dealing with complex data, that's where we went first. And then it turns out that doing the matrix on top of that was probably a lot easier for us, or for me, than doing it in the other way around. So I'm not apologizing, but as I said in, was it Florida? We should have done this years ago. Right, so that's where we're at with 14.1. And that's all very well and good, and it's nice. Now, <coughs> however, I'm aware that not all of you have your data in your workspace. It might be spread out, it might be all over the place. Let me now start a new interpreter and talk to you now about some experimental stuff that we're looking at which hopefully we'll end up in version 15. And unfortunately, I am going to have to go through this rather quickly. So I'm going to load this workspace, and I'm going to show you this example, which is nice and trivial. It's, it's one of the world's most favorite showbiz couples. Or, or, was that, or was that a dream? I, 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 this week's all a bit of a blur. Okay, so it's a matrix. It has it has three rows: age, name, location, um, and it and it's me and my current beau. Um, these long distance relationships really. Rumor has it, she might be seeing somebody else. But let me show you how this works. Okay, I said that it doesn't matter 
how we get our data as long as we implement the correct interfaces. What this code is doing, okay, is it's doing all the same stuff, it's loading some XAML, it's using an iBeam to create a data context, but this is using one called 2013. And rather than taking the name of the data, it's actually being given the data directly. Now watch what happens when I trace into this, because this is quite significant and quite cool. We trace into this namespace called NS0, which was the argument that I gave to the function. And we end up calling a function called get columns. And what this does is it returns a 3x2 two two matrix in exactly, of exactly the same format that we did with the CD stuff. Okay, first column is the, co is the property name, second column is the types. I'm using empty strings for the types, just mean do the default, I don't care, just do whatever you want to do. So I'm going to carry on tracing through this. And the next thing that happens is we end up in a call to a thing called get count. There was two rows in the, in the data grid, so we're going to return two for our get count. Now I'm going to call the show dialog function, and this is the point that the GUI actually needs the data. So it calls the get rows function. And what get rows does, it returns, actually it returns a two element vector, it returns the row indices, and it also then returns a matrix of the appropriate rows for each of those indices. And if we do that, then we get our GUI, which has got retrieved the data by calling that code in that namespace that we've defined. Now, that namespace was in script because I wanted to be able to, you to see it all in its entirety. Okay? But you could have been any old namespace. As long as it had those three functions in it, it would have worked. So let's close this. Let's look at two more examples and then we can hand over to Alexi. Here I have a component file that contains those 3,466 elements of um, Porsche share prices. Here we have a namespace, PAH3, that contains those three functions. It contains get count, which does exactly what I just did in the session. It returns the number of columns, number of components in the file. It has a function called get columns, which returns the matrix of our column names, um, followed by an empty vector in the second column. And it contains a function called get rows, which does some manipulation. The interesting thing does is that it spits out the position, the row that's been asked for. And then it does the reads and returns the data. Um, skipping a couple of steps, we've got a variable up here called chunk. And that means that this function can return 20 rows at a time. And it spits out in the session every time it's been asked for data. So I'm not going to trace this because I've pretty much told you what it's going to do. So here's our same GUI before. This is exactly the same XAML from the previous example. The only difference is rather than being data bound to that matrix, it's been data bound to that namespace that contained those three bits of code. And you'll see a little zero has popped up in the session because we've been asked for row zero, but as an optimization, we provided the subsequent 19 rows as well. And this works exactly as it worked before. Not changed the GUI at all. But what you'll see is when I get down to the bottom of this list and it needs to scroll to get more data, calls our function again, which has returned the next 20 rows of data. And it keeps doing that. If I go backwards, it's already got it. It doesn't need to get it anymore. Obviously, this needs to be extended so you can change rows on the fly. So you can say, look, row 7 has changed and here's the new data, etc. And that, that'll come. But in this first instance, this is where we're at. So it goes through and it's dynamically returning the data as the data source. And the GUI doesn't know that's how it's doing it. That's just how it's doing it. Right, which brings me then to the, the brand new up-to-date version of the CD database. Okay. So, here it is. Here it will be in a moment. Again, it's rattling around on the disk. I can hear it. Okay, so here we go. So, I've been busy. I've been buying CDs. I have a minute left. Okay, so what we've got here, we've got the cover art, we've got the artist name, we've got the artist title, and we've got the index of the CD in the collection. So I'll just, um, anyone wants to hazard a guess about how many I've got? It was 2,400, I think, last year. I'll sit and lean on the scroll button for a while and we'll uh, see the numbers go up and down. 
thumb's not moving a great deal. I'll do it in page sizes instead. That'll probably get it down a little bit quicker. It's not moved yet. I'll pick it up, move it around a little bit. I might. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Okay, so, you know, they're all there. Look, it's a sequential list. They're all, they're all in there. Let's bring this down to the bottom. Let's see, see. Let's see if, <laughs> let's see if my wallet ran out at a, at a good round number, shall we? Okay, so there we go. That's two billion. Okay, and that, all that is doing is exactly the same thing that the other stuff was doing. That's it. All of it, namespace and namespace. Get count returns two billion. Get me the columns, it returns the types for each of the columns in our data. And this get rows function, okay, I'm cheating a little bit. The house isn't large enough. But it basically returns data in chunks of a hundred and it's just returning a hundred random rows out of the disk matrix that you saw. <laughs> but hopefully you can see that with real data um, and with somebody who knew what they were doing, you could extend this to return potentially huge amounts of data without actually needing to have it present in your workspace. Now, I think I've probably got two seconds left. Richard's arms are twitching. Um, what I'll do is I'll hand over to Alexi, and then maybe we'll both take questions together at the end, because I think what Alexi's going to show sort of moves on a little bit from, not from where I finished, but from where I was at ten minutes ago. So I'll take questions when Alexi's finished as well. Thank you.